Today in physics, we'll be talking about the Atwood machine and friction. This is part three. Okay, so we started off with a model of the Atwood machine where the main part is a square prism. But now let's replace this square prism uh, with an equilateral two n sided prism where n equals two, three, and so on. So when we had a square prism, n was equal to two. So the number of sides was two n, or in other words, two times two was four. So let's say we transition to some number of sides. For example, let's say n equals four. n, oops, n equals four. So the number of sides that we have, so the number of sides that we have is eight. So we have an octagon. So let's let's draw a sort of octagon here. One. Okay, so we have an octagon. And let's pretend it's an equilateral uh, octagon, octagonal prism. And there are n massless bodies on the n upper faces of the two n-sided prism. So, so then it was four on the top four faces, namely one, two, three, four. It's a little slanted, but it's okay. We have n massless bodies. So similar to P and Q from the previous parts. And these things serve the purpose of connecting the strings. We also have inextensible massless strings, once again, that connect each of these massless bodies. Now, all the strings can't be compressed or extended, and they are all taut, so none of them are, are not held to their maximum tension. Now we also have that the angle between uh, each face and the string is pi over 2n. So this angle here is pi over 2n. And similarly for all the other angles, although the, the diagram isn't drawn that great. So we have all angles, all angles is equal to pi over 2n, or in other words where 2n is Eight, so pi over eight. Now, once again, we have a coefficient, a coefficient of friction, of static friction, and it's the same as before, we'll call it mu zero. Okay, so now that we've transitioned from uh, starting with a square prism to any n-sided equilateral prism, two n-sided equilateral prism, we're going to have, uh, we have these two strings. So one of the strings is going to consist of a weight that has a mass of large M. And the other string will have another weight. And this has a mass of small M. Now we're asked to find the minimum value. So the minimum value of M that is required in order, in order for the system for the system to remain at rest, to remain at rest. So this is a similar problem to part two, where we had a square prism and we had two weights and we were asked to find the minimum weight of the minimum weight that would be required to keep that square prism system at rest. So now we're being more general with any 2n equilateral sided prism. So the octagonal prism was just an example where n equals four of an equilateral 2n sided prism. So we allow n to be any kind of number. So we can just draw the objects because those are the ones that won't change even when n changes. So m is acted upon by two forces, tension, pointing upward and gravity pointing downward. So gravity is large m times g and the upward tension we'll call t0. Now for m, smaller m, it also has two forces, the tension tn going upwards and the smaller gravitational force small m times g going downwards. And since on each of these objects there are only two forces acting upon it, 
upon each object and we know that the whole system has to remain at equilibrium so these two objects must also remain at equilibrium therefore we can conclude that the tensions and the gravitational forces are equal so namely t0 is equal to large m times g and tn is equal to small m times g now we know that the angle we'll call it alpha between each string and the face of the 2n Every face of the 2n sided prism is pi over 2n, pi over 2n, regardless of what it is. So we can decompose t0 into always, so this is t0 into two components with alpha here. So this is t0, and we have t0 cosine of alpha and t0 sine of alpha, where cosine is parallel to the parallel to the surface and t0 sine of alpha is perpendicular. We can always also decompose, uh, we can also decompose t1. So t1 becomes, if we say this is t1, t1, this is alpha, so we have t1 sine of alpha and t1 cosine of alpha. Now T1 might not necessarily be horizontal, it might be slanted based on how many sides of the prism there are, but we're going to uh, find, try and find the relationship between T0 and T1, and then T1 and T2, and so on, all the way until we can find a relationship between T n minus 1 and T n. Once we do that, then we can connect T0 and T n together and figure out what small m is in relation to big M in order for the system to remain at equilibrium. So let's start off with uh, figuring out the relationship between T0 and T1. Similar to uh, part one, we have uh, T, we also have a force of friction that is going to act against T0. So it'll act in the same direction as T1 times cosine of alpha. So this is the force of friction. And we know that the force of friction is equal to mu0 times the normal force where the normal force is equal to the normal force is equal to the two perpendicular components of both tensions added together so we have t1 plus t0 and they share sine alpha in common so we can factor that out now since we want this body to remain at rest uh, the two different parallel components of the tensions as well as friction must bounce. So we have T0 times cosine of alpha must be equal to T1 times cosine of alpha plus the force of friction since friction is helping T1 and going against T0. So the right side is equal to T1 times cosine alpha plus and we know the force of friction to be mu0 times T1 plus T0 times sine of alpha. So now we want to solve for T1 in relation to T0. So we find that T0 cosine of alpha minus mu0 T0 sine of alpha is equal to T1 plus mu0 of T1. So we can conclude therefore that T1 is going to be equal to T0 multiplied by a coefficient like so. So we can conclude this. Then we say, okay, there might be a pattern between, uh, because T0 and T1 aren't that special. The relationship between T1 and T2 and T2 and T3 and so on and so on all the way until we reach N, that we're probably going to just keep multiplying by the same coefficient. So let's see if that's true when we decompose uh, just any middle number, number of tension. So here we have a massless body, and it's acted upon by two tension forces as well as the normal force, which is drawn here in the normal force, as well as the force of friction. So now we can see that the two perpendicular components of the two perpendicular to the surface components of the two tensions, namely the ten the where the coefficient is sine alpha, that must be equal to the normal force, which in turn influence friction. But what we care about for uh, whether the object remains at rest or not 
is the friction force and the two tension components that are multiplied by cosine of alpha. In order for these to in order for the object to remain at rest, the massless body to remain at rest, we want these three part three forces to be equal to each other if they're facing the same direction. So Px times cosine of alpha should be equal to Tx plus 1 cosine of alpha plus the force of friction. So we know that the force of friction, the force of friction is equal to mu0 times the normal force, which is just the two perpendicular to the surface components. So Tx plus Tx plus 1 times sine of alpha. And once again, we want to solve for Tx plus 1 in relation to Tx. So we can conclude that Tx cosine alpha minus mu zero sine of alpha is equal to Tx plus 1 cosine alpha plus mu zero sine of alpha, following the same reasoning as before. So as a result, we find that Tx plus 1 is just equal to Tx times cosine alpha minus mu zero sine alpha over cosine alpha plus mu zero sine of alpha, which we can see is the same coefficient as before when we found the relationship between T0 and T1. Then what we can find is that if Tx plus 1 has some relationship to Tx, then perhaps its relationship to Tx minus 1 will just be the same coefficient squared alpha over cosine alpha plus mu zero sine alpha, except this time it's squared since once we've concluded that Tx plus 1 and Tx are no different than any other possible x's, then the coefficient will always be the same. And once we multiply them together, we always find that we square the, the difference between the two tensions. So in this case, Tx plus 1 and Tx minus 1, x plus 1 minus Tx minus 1 is going to equal 2. So we can conclude that Tx plus 1 has a relationship to T0, where the coefficient is, oops, that's a minus sign, is just simply the same coefficient raised to the power, the same coefficient raised to a power of x plus 1, since x plus 1 minus 0 is x plus 1. So, since we want to find the relationship between T0 and Tn, we can say that Tn is equal to T0 times the coefficient, which we found here, no need to write it again, is that coefficient raised to the nth power. Once we know that, we can plug in what we know about Tn and T0, namely what's up here. So, we have Tn is equal to small m times g, is equal to large m times g times the coefficient to the nth power. And once we know, we can see that g is on both sides, so we can cancel that out to get a relationship between small m and large m. So let's write it out more explicitly. After going through all that, we've now found the relationship between small m and large m, where small m is the minimum amount of mass in order to keep all of the bodies at rest, both the larger m weights as well as the massless bodies along this 2n equilateral sided prism. And also keep in mind that we define alpha to be pi over 2n, also known as pi over the number of sides of our equilateral prism.